Good afternoon. My apologies for being late, but uh, could not be helped due to our commute this today. Uh, I am Councilmember Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection. I want to recognize that I have two of, uh, members of our committee here today, Councilmember Rafael Espinal and Councilmember Calvin Yeager, both from Brooklyn. Thank you both for being here. Uh, today, the committee will hold oversight on the mission, work, and accomplishments of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and the Office of Recovery and Resiliency. Uh, with the work of these two offices, the Mayor has made it clear that ours is a city constantly working to stay ahead of the climate change curve. And we do this by addressing growth and income inequality at the same time that we address sustainability. At today's hearing, we'll hear from the administration about the progress made in advancing this work to date. The New York City Mayor's Office of Sustainability, MOS, works to improve the quality of life for all New Yorkers and to protect the common environment by ensuring the city has clean air and surface waters, green streets, and is moving city residents towards zero carbon and zero waste goals. MOS works to reduce NYC's impact on climate change by implementing strategies to limit greenhouse gas emissions from the city's transportation, energy, waste, and building sectors. The Office of, of ORR, Office of uh, Recovery and Resiliency, was established in 2014 by Mayor de Blasio to lead the city's effort to build a stronger, more resilient New York. Guided by scientific data and analysis of the New York City Panel on Climate Change, OR works to ensure that NYC's communities, economy, and public services can withstand and combat the impacts of 21st century threats such as climate change. This work spearheading a resiliency program with about a $20 million budget. Together, MOS and OOR play a significant role in the city's effort to mitigate, adapt, and recover from climate change. The offices are guided by and oversee several city initiatives, including the One NYC Plan and its related greenhouse gas reduction and climate resiliency goals, along with the efforts to recover and rebuild from Superstorm Sandy. When NYC is Mayor de Blasio's update of the previous administration's Plan NYC, When NYC is divided into four sections or visions, each with a theme of growth, equity, sustainability, and resiliency, Today's hearing will focus on the latter two visions of sustainability and resiliency. New York City is responsible for 1% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the entire nation. We have taken a number of aggressive steps to advance the goals enumerated in 1 NYC. New York City passed my local law, 66 of 2014, which requires the city to reduce citywide greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. While many steps have been taken to reduce greenhouse gases and improve sustainability, we still have a lot of work to do. And if some things we've committed uh, have not been yet completed, at a minimum, climate change education and community partnerships need to be strengthened. When NYC puts forward initiatives towards achieving 80 by, 80 by 50 goal, one is to develop the near-term local actions and long-term regional strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the power sector, the second initiative is to develop a mode shift action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. The third initiative is to build up zero waste to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the solid waste sector. And the fourth initiative is to continue implementation of one city built to last to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from buildings 30% by 2025, which isn't that far away as, it, as we feel, right? It's about seven years away, to chart a long-term path from away from fossil fuels. Buildings including fuel heating oil, natural gas, electricity, steam, biofuel are responsible for over 70 percent of our citywide greenhouse gas emissions. Given this and the, vast fa and, and the vast majority of existing buildings are expected to remain well beyond 2050, the city's stock of 1,100,000 buildings represent the greatest potential source <coughs> of citywide greenhouse gas emissions. Is indisputably necessary for the city to reduce emissions from the building sector. Six years ago, the council enacted the Greens Buildings Law, affecting over 50,000 square feet. Now that legislation needs to be strengthened to accelerate retrofitting of large buildings, which we are working on. Those measures, when undertaken, will make the city a national sustainability leader and keep the city's promise to future generations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and protect our earth. Uh, you know, this, I really look at this in, in two parts, right? I think we've talked about this together. This is, we're going to be looking at the promises we've made uh, to those who were affected by climate change and, and S Hurricane Sandy. 
We're going to make sure today we're going to talk about those promises and how we're keeping them and making sure that as we move forward, those promises are kept. And then looking to future and saying what is our resiliency and sustainability goals for the future? How do we make sure as climate change affects us, whether it's heat, whether it's uh, another catastrophic event, whether it's just, you know, every day is a little bit, every time it rains, it's just a little bit more flooding in Southeast Queens, an extra inch. Those inches add up. And how are we going to be proactive as a city on these particular issues together? Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing that testimony today, uh, not only what we've done, but how we can think about uh, our sustainability plan and our resiliency plan for the future as we know climate change is going to impact the city in different ways. And you've, well, we've talked about these issues together. So I look forward to having this back and forth conversa conversation. Uh, no one else has time yet, so I will, I will this time, uh, we are, uh, let's hear from the administration. So we have, uh, Char oh. oh, Eric Bell, what a smile. Uh, we have Eric Ulrich also here from Queens. Councilmember Eric Ulrich. So we have, uh, I'm just going to let you all introduce yourselves. <laughs> so uh, Samara's going to swear in the administration panel, and then we'll uh, take the testimony. Thank you. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. Over to us? Yeah. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dan Zarilli. I'm the Mayor's Senior Director for Climate Policy and Programs and the City's Chief Resilience Officer. I want to thank you, Chairperson Constantinides, and members of the committee for this opportunity to speak about the progress that de Blasio administration has made as a global leader in the fight against climate change. Today I'm going to briefly describe the City's actions to address climate change, a description of the team that leads the City's climate program, and an overview of the three main themes of our current work before turning it over to my colleagues. First, a bit of history. New York City first formed an Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability in 2006 to develop a strategic plan that included climate action for the first time. That plan, known as Plan YC, was released in 2007 and shaped the city's actions to address future threats in a number of ways. In October 2012, the impacts of Hurricane Sandy brought home the reality that climate risks were much more immediate than many had thought, and the risks were not limited to hurricanes. Rising seas, more heat, stronger storms threaten us as well. In response, th in June 2013, the city released its first comprehensive climate resiliency plan to supplement its climate actions and set forth a detailed risk assessment and new initiatives, launching an over $20 billion program to prepare New York City for a future with climate change. When the de Blasio administration came into office, that legacy informed our work, and we knew that we had to expand on it as well. In April 2015, the administration released a groundbreaking One New York, the plan for a strong and just city that we call One NYC a strategic plan for inclusive growth and climate action. One NYC, supported by our partnership with 100 Resilient Cities, addressed the challenges that we face as a city with growing population, an inequality crisis, aging infrastructure, as well as the risks of climate change. What was previously known as the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability is now operating as the Climate Policy and Programs team, charged with delivering the sustainability and resiliency portions of One NYC, with a new focus on equity. Today, we're continuing to deliver on these commitments from One NYC. The team, with direct reporting to the first deputy mayor, is leading the administration's efforts to deepen our climate work, fill the void of leadership left by Washington, D.C., and deliver results for New Yorkers. Our team's current climate actions can best be summed up in three themes, sustainability, resiliency, and accountability. Our climate mitigation or sustainability work is focused on reducing our own contribution to climate change by cutting our greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible. This work is led by Mark Chambers and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, the mandate of which is to make New York City the most sustainable big city in the world and a global leader in the fight against climate change. To accomplish this goal, the MOS team is working to keep the city on track to meet our goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050, or what we call 80 by 50, an effort that we recently accelerated to align with the Paris Agreement's 1.5 Celsius uh, stretch goal. We've already achieved the 15% reduction. Getting to the 80 by 50 means making our buildings, the largest sources of GHGs in the city, much more energy efficient, expanding renewable energy options, sending zero waste to landfills by 2030, and improving our air quality. Mark's going to speak a lot more about this work. Our climate adaptation, or resiliency work, focuses on adapting the city to the risks of climate change, such as rising seas, more frequent and intense storms, and extreme heat. This work is led by Janie Bavishi and the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, ORR's specific mandates to ensure that the city's neighborhoods, economy, and public services are prepared to withstand and emerge stronger from the impacts of climate change and other 21st century threats. 
To accomplish this goal, the ORR team is working with many agencies to deliver on the city's over $20 billion investment program and institutionalizing resiliency into city operations more broadly. And Janie's going to get into this in a, uh, in a bit more detail. And finally, New York City is bringing this fight straight to the fossil fuel companies that caused this climate crisis in the first place. With their decades-long campaign of deception and denial about the risks caused by burning fossil fuels, and we're doing this in two ways. We're divesting our pension funds of approximately $5 billion in fossil fuel reserve owners by 2022, and we filed suit against five investor-owned fossil fuel companies, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, BP, and Shell. Most responsible, these are the companies most responsible for climate change, and, are, and we're seeking damages to pay for preparing the city for the impacts of climate change. All of this work not only benefits New Yorkers, it also serves as a model to other cities around the nation and the, around the world. Through networks such as the C40 Climate Leadership Group, 100 Resilient Cities, and others, we're demonstrating the ways in which we can combat climate change and working with other cities to scale up effective solutions. As you'll continue to hear today, this team is making significant strides across the entire administration and in partnership with the City Council and many stakeholders on the necessary actions to prepare New York City for the future. We've achieved much. We've been recognized with significant awards, and yet we have so much more to do before we'll ever be satisfied. I'd like to thank the Council and the members of the Environmental Protection Committee for your close partnership and shared commitment to our goals. We look forward to continuing our work with you as we build a more sustainable and resilient New York City. I'll turn it over to Mark Chambers. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Chambers. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. Similar to my colleagues, I want to thank Chair Member, uh, Chairperson Constantinides and the members of this committee for the opportunity to discuss the work of MOS. The council and this committee have been invaluable partners uh, over the years, so again, we thank you very much. MOS's charge is to ensure New York City is the most sustainable big city in the world. Our work at MOS is grounded in, in the belief that environmental sustainability, environmental justice, and economic sustainability for our residents must work hand in hand. We recognize that to become the most sustainable big city in the world, we have to be conscientious about <coughs> of, <coughs> excuse me, of the resources we consume and the structures we build and where we build them. We have to act with urgency while innovating because of the unique conditions of our density in our island home. And most importantly, we recognize we have to do things on a bolder scale than ever before because the challenges are greater than ever before. As Dan mentioned, we've known for years that we have to address the existential crisis of climate change. Across the globe, greenhouse gas emissions are growing at an unprecedented rate, causing a rise in average global temperature and changes to climate patterns. The hurricanes that devastated the Gulf and the Caribbean and the wildfires in the American West have showed us the terrible cost of our warming planet. We had hoped we could depend on Washington for leadership, but sadly we could not. President Trump's decision to fold the United States out of the Paris Climate Agreement last year, simply put, was a failure in moral leadership on one of the most significant challenges facing humanity. Even before the failure in Washington, we, underst <coughs> we understood the risk posed by climate change and we were taking action to reduce our emissions 80% by 2050. Then, in June of last year, uh, Mayor de Blasio signed Executive Order 26, committing New York City to the principles of the Paris Agreement and its stretch goal to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Hundreds of other US cities and institutions followed suit, sending a profound signal to the world that the majority of Americans will not retreat from this existential fight. The success of Paris Agreement hinges now more than ever on the involvement of cities like New York to put their resources, their innovation, and their leadership into play. Please allow me to briefly outline some of the progress that the de Blasio administration has made on the sustainability front. I'm sure, as I'm sure Janie will uh, reiterate in her remarks, everything you'll hear today about our accomplishments is the sum of efforts by numerous city agencies, community organizations, and advocates, as well as private and philanthropic, philanthropic partners. So on to our progress. Our greenhouse gas emissions are down significantly. Since 2005, GHGs have decreased citywide by approximately 15%, despite significant growth of the city's population and economy. Per capita GHG emissions in 2015 was an average of 6.1 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per capita, significantly lower than average Americans uh, 19 uh, metric tons per capita. Part of this could be attributed to the nearly $500 million the city is spending on energy efficiency in private buildings. Our buildings are greener. The energy used in 
the city's building stock, is the largest contributor to GHGs. The city is cutting greenhouse gases in its own buildings by investing in high-value energy efficiency projects. These projects are expected to yield more than $67 million in avoided annual energy costs and approximately 176,000 metric tons of avoided GHG emissions, the equivalent of taking almost 38,000 cars off the road. The city has also contributed roughly $16 million for energy efficiency projects in private buildings. This year, the New York City Retrofit Accelerator launched a new high-performance retrofit track to assist private buildings with retrofits over the next 10 to 15 years, which are expected to reduce GHGs 40 to 60 percent. And the NYC Carbon Challenge is working with more than 100 companies and organizations to have voluntarily committed to reducing their GHGs 30 to 50 percent. To date, participants have cut emissions by close to 600,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide and are collectively saving nearly $190 million in annual, annually in, in lower energy costs. Solar installations have increased, six, have increased sixfold since Mayor de Blasio took office. Part of this increase is the result of Solarize NYC, our program to expand access to clean, reliable, and affordable solar power for all New Yorkers by reducing market barriers for solar and by attracting more solar energy companies to the city. Solarize NYC has active campaigns in Harlem and Brownsville, with more partnerships on, on the way. The first official campaign was announced in 2017 and featured solar campaign partnership with WE Act for Environmental Justice called Solar Uptown Now. Which, centered in, which was centered in Harlem. More recently, Solarize Nehemiah launched a group uh, purchasing campaign for rooftop solar for the Nehemiah homes in Brownsville, Brooklyn. We're rapidly expanding access to electric vehicles, or EVs. In 2015, the city decided to lead by example with the launch of the NYC Clean Fleet, which included the commitment to create the largest municipal electric fleet in the United States with the goal of cutting municipal vehicle emissions in half by 2025, scaling up to an 80% reduction by 2035. By the end of 2017, the city had already procured 1,030 out of 2,000 electric vehicle sedans it committed to integrate into the fleet by 2025. In 2017, Mayor de Blasio announced the city's ambitious goal of having electric vehicles comprise 20% of new vehicle registrations by 2025. To support this goal, the city has invested in creating EV fast charging hubs to be developed in collaboration with Con Edison. These fast charging hubs will be scaled up to a total of 50 locations citywide by 2020 and accompanied by 100 curbside parking spots to provide access to multi-hour charging. We're sending less waste to landfills than ever before. Organic wastes like food scraps, soiled paper, and yard waste generate methane gas, a harmful greenhouse gas, and this waste accounts for one third of everything New Yorkers throw away. E-waste in our landfills leach heavy metals and can, can compromise our ecosystem. To address this, the city's organics collection program is now the largest in the country, serving more than 3.3 million residents and our e-waste program has recycled more than 15 million pounds of electronic waste since 2015. New York City's air is the cleanest in five decades. New York City's air quality is the cleanest it has been in 50 years, but we're re still redoubling our efforts to uh, ensure our air gets only cleaner by helping buildings choose cleaner energy sources through our green buildings and solarized NYC programs. Over the course of the year, we will continue to act with urgency and boldness in our effort to make New York City the most sustainable big city in the world. But our success depends in large part on deepening our partnership with the council and this committee. We are interested in working with the council to pass energy efficiency mandates, as was discussed earlier, for large buildings. And we're exploring ideas to further expand access to solar and to electric vehicles, as well as reducing um, single-use plastics. In conclusion, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to discuss MOS's portfolio and the progress we've made in ensuring that our air is cleaner, our energy is greener, and that we send less waste to landfills. Fulfilling our climate agenda is no easy task, and we look forward to deepening our partnership with the council in that effort. I will now turn the floor over to Janie Bavishi to update the committee on the city's resiliency work. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Good afternoon. I am Janie Bavishi, the Mayor's Director of Recovery and Resiliency. 
I want to thank Chairperson Constantinidis and the members of the committee for this opportunity to speak about the work and the accomplishments of the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency and the complementary role my office plays to MOS's climate sustainability work. Five years ago, Hurricane Sandy devastated New York City with unprecedented force. It was the worst natural disaster we've ever faced, made worse by climate change. As we assessed the damage, it was clear that we could not just plan to simply recover from the storm. Instead, we used that moment to not only address the risks of another Sandy, but to broaden our approach to the chronic risks of climate change. In May of 2014, Mayor Bill de Blasio established ORR to lead the effort to build a stronger, more resilient New York. ORR spearheads an over $20 billion One NYC Resiliency Program to ensure that the city's neighborhoods, economy, and public services will be ready to withstand and emerge stronger from the impacts of climate change. Since its creation, ORR has been at the forefront of the global resiliency movement that is changing the way cities respond to climate change. As Dan mentioned, in April 2015, Mayor de Blasio released One NYC. Not only was the document groundbreaking in its focus on becoming the fairest city in America, it was also the first resiliency plan of any city on the planet. Guiding the city's resiliency agenda is the administration's commitment to use the best available science to inform policy. The New York City Panel on Climate Change, an independent body of leading climate scientists, advises the mayor on the latest localized climate change projections. Because of the increases in global temperatures as a result of the burning of fossil fuels and other greenhouse gases, the NPCC projects that by the 2050s, average New York City temperatures are projected to increase by 4.1 to 5.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Annual precipitation is projected to increase between 4 and 11 percent. And sea levels are projected to rise between 11 and 21 inches. And that is on top of a foot of sea level rise that we have already witnessed since 1900. What this means is that extreme events like flooding and heat waves are becoming more frequent and more intense. And a similar Sandy-like event in 2050 could cause $90 billion in damage compared to Sandy's $19 billion. With these climate facts in mind, something that is short, in short supply in Washington, we're making bold and innovative investments in preparedness and resiliency that make sense for today and tomorrow. As additional changes in the climate began to materialize and sea level rise accelerates, different options might become more practical or per perhaps even absolutely imperative. That's why we're investing in such a way so as not to preclude future actions we may need to take at cli as climate risks evolve. I'd like to briefly describe the city's progress with our One NYC Resiliency Plan, comprised of a multi-layered approach to neighborhoods, buildings, infrastructure, and coastal defense. Needless to say, our resiliency work, is the, the, our resiliency work to date is the product of a massive team effort led out of the mayor's office and implemented by nearly every city agency and includes state and federal agencies as well as a myriad of community organizations and private and philanthropic partners. Our city is safer and more resilient than it was before Hurricane Sandy and much more is coming. Our neighborhoods are more resilient. Tens of thousands of households are benefiting from investments in single family, multifamily and public housing stock. Building and zoning codes have been upgraded. Every school damage during Sandy was up and running in record time and we continue to make significant progress in making our schools more resilient. We provided $54 million to hundreds of local small businesses to assist in their recovery from Sandy and launched Business Prep and Rise NYC to support their long-term resiliency. And last year, we re released Cool Neighborhoods NYC, a comprehensive strategy to mitigate the drivers of extreme heat and protect the most vulnerable New Yorkers from the impacts of extreme heat. Our building standards are smarter. We upgraded the city's building codes, including 16 new local laws to account for vulnerabilities related to extreme weather and climate change. Additionally, FEMA, in partnership with the city, is drafting new, more precise flood insurance maps that will more accurately communicate flood risk and keep premiums affordable. The city is also working with FEMA to create a second map product, product reflecting future conditions that account for climate change. This will assist us in making coastlines more resilient and climate ready, while keeping flood insurance affordable for those who need it. Our infrastructure is better protected. This includes upgraded traffic infrastructure, hardened telecommunication systems, new green infrastructure, and we continue to fortify our wastewater treatment plants, all of which ensure vital public services continue during and after emergencies. And DEP investments ensure uninterrupted access to high quality drinking water, including a new backup water siphon in Staten Island. 
We've also released preliminary climate resiliency design guidelines, which provide direction to engineers and designers on how to incorporate resilience considerations into all capital projects. Our coastal defenses are being implemented and our stormwater management efforts are stronger. This includes a new Rockaway boardwalk with integrated coastal protections, completed tea groins in Seagate, and nearly 10 miles of new dunes across the Rockaway Peninsula and in Staten Island. Construction is underway on new sewer infrastructure in Southeast Queens and expanded blue belts in Staten Island to reduce the impacts of flooding. And we're looking forward to breaking ground on the $760 million Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project next spring. Over the course of 2018, the ORR team will continue building New York City's resilience to the impacts of climate change. The city has some of the brightest and most dedicated people working every day on behalf of our residents. But we can't do it alone. So much of what we do depends on the experiences of community, communities directly affected by climate change, as well as local and global resilience experts. Our success also depends on our partnership with the council and this committee to help foster a culture of resilience in New York City one that is grounded in the lessons of Hurricane Sandy, but is ultimately geared to addressing the, risks, uh, the broader risks of climate change that we face. For example, how we manage stormwater and how we use land will be critical to how we weather future storms. I look forward to having these conversations with the council. As I conclude my testimony, I wanna thank this committee for this opportunity. Building urban resilience in the age of climate change is a long-term process. We will always need to innovate and adapt to account for changes in rising temperatures and seas. Success will look different at different points in our future, but it will always demand democratic partnership and collaboration across actors at all levels of society. We thank the committee for its dedication to this issue and look forward to working with the council as we continue to protect our city from the risks of climate change. I will now turn the floor over to Amy Peterson from the Housing Recovery Office to update the committee on the progress of the Build It Back program and the city's housing recovery efforts. Hi, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Chairperson and members of the Committee on Environmental Protection. I'm Amy Peterson. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Housing Recovery Operations, which manages the Build It Back program. Thanks for inviting me to testify today. Through the city's Hurricane Sandy Housing Recovery Program, Build It Back, the city has prioritized helping homeowners remain in their affordable, long-standing waterfront communities, ensuring these New Yorkers have the resources necessary to recover and make their homes and communities more resilient. Within the city's hardest hit, Waterfront Communities Build It Back is rebuilding and elevating approximately 1,375 homes to today's stringent regulations for flood compliance. Another 6,675 homeowners with moderate sandy damage have been assisted with repair and reimbursement, helping neighborhoods that were not in the floodplain when Sandy hit and homeowners who did not have flood insurance. Approximately 250 homes are being acquired through a combination of buyout and acquisition programs. Build It Back provided multiple ways for homeowners to repair and rebuild their homes, including the direct management of construction projects by the city, City Managed Construction. Over the last few years, the city has brought on additional resources to ensure that we can get this work done, from partnering with the building and construction trades unions to expand construction capacity in 2015, to adding our new modular program in 2017. As a result of this concerted effort, the city has completed 97% of the city managed construction projects and 90% of all construction projects, including the homeowner managed construction. We are working on the last elevations and rebuilds, including the new modular program, an innovative program expanding contractor capacity and speeding the duration of construction for each home, community-based projects, including groups of attached homes in Coney Island and new infrastructure in Sheepshead Bay Courts, and our most complex and challenging elevations and rebuilds throughout Queens. Overall, Build It Back through its single family program is helping 8,300 homeowners and landlords of one to four unit homes, housing a total of 12,500 families. Build It Back has served over 99% of these homeowners by starting construction, reimbursement for repairs, or acquisition of their homes. For 93% of those homeowners, we've completed construction, reimbursement, and acquisition. We've distributed over $133 million in checks to over 6,100 6, families. Through our construction partner, HPD, we've accelerated relief to multifamily households, benefiting more than 19,600 households and 143 developments through repair, resiliency, and reimbursement services. Funded by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Build It Back program, single family program, is funded by a $2.2 billion federal community development block grant dollars and overseen by our office in coordination with HPD and the Department of Design and Construction. 
the CDBGDR disaster recovery funds provide assistance to homeowners after all the other forms of disaster assistance have been exhausted. Hurricane Sandy impacted neighborhoods outside FEMA's 100-year floodplain, and as a result, Build It Back's repair and reimbursement program provided much needed support for homeowners who didn't have flood insurance and many of whom were outside the floodplain. About half of the housing flooded by Sandy was outside of FEMA's 100-year floodplain, and of those in the floodplain, less than 50% of those had flood insurance. Two-thirds of Build It Back homeowners receiving the repair and reimbursement lived outside of the floodplain, and only one quarter of those homeowners had received NFIP payments. For this reason, we are encouraging residents to purchase flood insurance. In 2014, the city um, dedicated funding to provide rental assistance to homeowners displaced by construction so they are not burdened with existing mortgage payments and additional rental payments while their homes are being elevated or rebuilt. We expanded our services to include comprehensive relocation assistant, assistance, partnering with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, and the New York Disaster Interfaith Services. Services were designed to help address barriers to securing temporary housing, including large multi-generational families, um, specific physical or mobility needs, and pet-friendly units. Nearly 1,100 homeowners have received assistance with temporary housing and relocation, and 83% of those homeowners were temporarily relocated within their original community or their borough. Hurricane Sandy was an unprecedented storm for New York City. Build it back, build it back, began with key policy decisions that drove subsequent successes and challenges. The city prioritized keeping families in their homes and neighborhoods and prioritized homeowner choice in the process. The resulting program design and implementation have been driven by many factors, including the unique nature of housing and site conditions in New York City, specifically in the communities most impacted by Hurricane Sandy, in southern Brooklyn, southern Queens, and the east and south shores of Staten Island. An ever-evolving regulatory environment from 2013 today, ranging from post-Sandy changes to building codes and flood map requirements, the need to complete thousands of single-family home construction projects in the busiest construction market in decades, and I wouldn't say of the least, the, the complexities of providing relief within the federal disaster funding framework. We have learned so much collectively over the last five years about what it takes to elevate and rebuild homes in these communities, about the importance of clear communication on how different federal programs, from flood insurance to SBA loans to HUD-funded programs, can assist homeowners during the recovery, and about the imp impact of neighborhood resiliency planning. This is why we believe the Joint City Council and Mayoral Sandy Recovery Task Force is such an important effort for the city. With your partnership, we will lay out the principles and best practices for future recovery efforts with a focus on preparedness, technical assistance for building owners, and community engagement. The transformation in these neighborhoods is remarkable, and I would welcome the opportunity to take the committee on a tour to see these homes. Thank you. I think, based on the nodding from many of my colleagues here, I think we might take you up on that offer. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm going to ask a few questions, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues um, to ask questions. I don't want to monopolize all the time. Um, that said, let me ask a little bit about, you know, what is the level of funding allocated for city agencies for renewable energy projects? So renewable energy projects in particular relate to solar or? Well, in, in, in general, right? I mean, there's, mm -hmm. I'm going to try to go through all, let's, let's go through all of it then. Well, I mean, I think the best way to say it is that uh, the city has allocated $1.2 billion over 10 years towards right. um, uh, projects that range in all levels of energy efficiency, including solar and including preparing buildings to be able to, um, uh, to access more, more renewables and more distributed generation. All right, so 1.2 billion over 10 years. How much of that have we spent so far? So we spent approximately 500 million. About 500 million, and what is, what is that? What have we walked me through? What did that? You know, what, did, what did we get for that? How did it walk me through what we got as far as solar projects? I think you put it, it's in your testimony, right? Yeah. Sorry. Let's uh, just re, we, let's re go through that. So so far, uh, so the pr the predominant agency that distributes these funds is DCAS, the Department of Citywide mm -hmm. Administrative Services. They have uh, installed about 10 megawatts of solar already. Right. Okay. Um, that's on 57 city buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, uh, they're going to install an additional 100 uh, megawatts of solar by 2025. Uh, 
the intent is to uh, start construction on 100 projects this year, uh, which will ultimately add an additional 18 megawatts to the city's um, uh, solar capacity, totaling 29 megawatts over the year. And how are we working with the city agencies to implement? How do, how do we choose the buildings? How do we sort of roll this out effectively? And, and when we're building a new building or we're, we're doing construction in the city building, how are we making those choices and betting that into those agencies to make sure that's a consideration for them? Absolutely. Uh, it is a, it's an all-hands-on-deck effort. Uh, right. I would look at this from the point of view of preparing cities, agencies to be able to respond to code changes that we've worked with this committee and many others on to uh, uh, establish thresholds for new construction. But as far as actually deploying the, the dollars, uh, DCAS in particular has utilized several different mechanisms to bring agencies together. Uh, there's an ACE program which allows for city agencies to uh, suggest energy uh, efficient projects to, to DCAS in which they will evaluate and then they will grant money out of that 1.2 billion to making sure that agencies are building uh, new buildings and retrofitting their buildings with those dollars to get the maximum amount of efficiency out of those projects. From the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, we help with that coordination and from the Mayor's <coughs> Office to make sure that city agencies from DCAS to SCA to um, Department of Education, everyone that is building um, uh, buildings in the city um, is working together and that has only become even more strengthened as we um, push forward on other um, sustainability plans, in particular our 1.5 degree plan, uh, which uh, better aligns the city agencies towards those goals. I mean, I'm looking at, yeah, they're building an extension in a school in my district, just for an example. Are, are we gonna, how do we ensure that the sustainability uh, aspects and resiliency aspects get baked into that cake before it's built, right? It, it's a lot easier to bake those things in at the beginning than to go back and have to retrofit them down the line and say, oh, we're gonna, now we're gonna have to change everything we've done. So how do we ensure that we're baking those into the cake at the, at the front end and rather than having to go back and retrofit them later? Absolutely. Uh, the, the best way to do that is by aggressively pushing on energy codes and aggressively pushing on building standards to make sure that everyone is operating from the same rule book and that those buildings um, are, as a base, are incorporating uh, energy efficiency strategies into their, their outcomes and into their construction plans. So just looking at um, Local Law 6 of 2016 uh, that required the development of a geothermal uh, screening tool, mm -hmm. uh, as well as a detailed analysis of geothermal technology installation on city-owned buildings. How is the screening tool coming? Uh, is, it av is it publicly available yet? The report is, is publicly available. The screening tool will be online this summer. Okay. And, and so we're very excited about that to make sure that the screening tool is a, it's a first screening to allow for um, any user to be able to look at both the geological and the hydrological um, benefits of, of different areas across the city and, and be able to use that as a tool to determine whether or not geothermal is appropriate for that. It also analyzes different types of geothermal technologies to see what might be best in those locations. And as far as uh, city-owned buildings that are doing major construction projects, have there been any yet and where the cost-benefit analysis found that geothermal was the, the, the right way to go, looking at the social costs of carbon as well. So that I have to come back to you on, uh, okay. just to check on, on which, which projects have completed that analysis. And, and as far as we're looking at the, the NYCHA boilers and, and the, the 200 million that we're spending on these new boilers, on, on fossil fuel boilers, have we considered doing renewable energy as a, either supplement or a substitute? Um, to these boilers and, and how, you know, how have those conversations gone? Um, so I think part of that answer is, um, you know, these boilers are definitely going to be new boilers and so they're very much more energy efficient boilers mm -hmm. to provide that heat. There's a, a need to provide the heat as quickly as possible into these, mm -hmm. uh, into these developments. So I think our team um, can probably go back and find out a little bit more detailed information on the exact standards and how that's going to be applied. Okay. All right, and as far as, you know, so we have, uh, our, and I, I knew it as, what was it, 478, our bill? Mm -hmm. So I, I knew it as, as, you know, the bill that we had for, so this is the last one I'll ask, and then I'll, I'll, t I'll two more, I have one and one other after this. Um, our solar ready on city-owned buildings bill. Um, when something's deemed not solar ready, what are the steps that we take to make those, you know, we can't just say afterwards, well, you know, not solar ready, you know, it's too bad, like how do we then you know, m work to make sure those buildings become solar ready over a five year period or whatever it is? 
absolutely. The first, the determination of being solar ready has ma many components: uh, size of, of the building, structural capacity of the building, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, if the, a building is determined not to be solar ready, then it depends on what would it take to get there, um, and that then goes into the framework of how. Each, each of the construction agencies are evaluating adding those components to, to projects that are coming online for those buildings. So if a building is then uh, slated for, let's say a facade you know, replacement or, or upgrade, adding the components that would make the, the building solar ready are then um, added to that project. Same thing goes for um, electrical roofs and so forth. And so we're doing construction, we're, we're taking that into consideration as well, we're baking that into the cake as well, saying that um, you know, some things are not going to be solar ready. If you're standing next to a 12-story building and you're a five-story building, there's nothing we can do there. Right. Um, but when we're doing construction on a school or a library, uh, are th is there mayoral money coming in? Because I know that very often um, council members and borough presidents put the dollars in um, for school upgrades and, and library upgrades in particular. Um, how are we making sure that DDC and, and they're, they're we're adding additional mayoral dollars for sustainability and resiliency? to make those roofs solar ready or to make the, the buildings resilient? I mean, I think to, to kind of reiterate the, the answer to your original question about the, the, the retrofit money, that's exactly what it's being used for, is to be able to, where we can do energy efficiency projects that are the, the first in line and the, the low-hanging fruit, absolutely, and where there's a little bit more work that needs to be done to allow the, the sites to fully take advantage of uh, whether it is solar or whether it is cool roofs as well, which has a significant impact on the, on the buildings, those are then incorporated into those buildings in their uh, construction. Because I know, and, and, and I, got, I can only use my district, and I know my colleagues will use their districts as form of references. I, I have a $3 million project coming in one of my libraries. It's going to close this summer. Um, I just want to make sure that as that's happening, that we're building in opportunities for solar and for resiliency. And, and it, you know, does that change the scope of the DDC project, but then, then puts the project off years away? or? That's something that DDC is already taking into account. I keep driving this point home, but I want to make sure that um, we're getting good answers here and, and that we're, we're flagging this, as all my colleagues, I'm sure, will as well. We're happy to follow up on that as well. Okay, great. And the last thing I have is on, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to pass this off. I'm going to let my colleagues add. I just wanted to add from a resiliency perspective, I mentioned in my testimony that we've released preliminary climate resiliency design guidelines, and it's for this exact purpose, so right. that when we are spending money on city, city capital, when we're spending city capital on capital projects, that we are accounting for uh, resiliency considerations as we design and build those projects, and we're working very closely with OMB uh, on, on those guidelines. So when, so when they, so I'm going to go, I'm going to take that a, deep, a, deep, a little bit deeper then. So when they put out a cost to a council member, it says, you know, there it's going to cost two million dollars to renovate a library. Though resiliency and sustainability aspects are built into that cost. Uh, I can't speak to how uh, <laughs> DDC presents costs to a council member. Uh, <laughs> I would uh, so I'll leave that one alone. Um, but but I, I do think that we're we're. The, the climate resiliency design guidelines are just one instrument that are going to help us build a culture of resilience. And, and that's ultimately what we need to do. We need to start baking these costs in. We need to start accounting for them because uh, baking them in now will essentially make our investments go further in the future. And there's all this – go ahead, Mark. So I'll just one more point to that is, is Local Law 31 also contributes to this. I mentioned before about making sure that the standards are in place so that everyone's working from the same rule book. Local Law 31, which goes into effect this year, does require city buildings to achieve a very low energy standard, so that also helps in being able to make sure it's baked in from the beginning. Okay, I'm, I'm going to probably come back for a second round because I have more, but I don't want to monopolize the microphone. Um, so uh, who is uh, who's up first? Um, Richard and then Menchak. All right, so uh, first I'll, I'll pass it off to Councilmember Richards and then uh, Councilmember Menchaka. Thank you, Councilmember Carson, for sure. Thank you. I know my colleagues want me to stop asking so many questions when I chair hearings too. <laughs> but uh, but uh, such an honor to be here. <laughs> um, uh, Mark, uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is your first budget here. It is my so first hearing. Congratulations. You didn't do so bad. I appreciate that. <laughs> but I didn't get through my questions yet. So. Let's begin. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, just a few questions. So I wanted to go through what are your strategies around air quality and what are you still seeing as some of the largest uh, contributors to, who are some of the largest contributors to poor air quality in the city and sort of what are some of the strategies you're looking towards uh, in your new capacity? Sure, so 
I mean, I, I want to point out, I mentioned in my testimony that New York City does have the, the best air quality it's had in the last five decades. So progress is being made, but progress still needs to be made. Mm -hmm. um, being able to uh, look at the reductions from air quality, localized air quality, again, has a lot to do with how we are treating our building sector mm -hmm. and how we are focusing our attention on being able to, first, with the support of this committee, transition out of dirtier fuels to, mm -hmm. uh, to cleaner fuels, which um, the city has been very active in, and very uh, successful in transitioning, but we have more work to do. Being able to look at our building sector and being able to reduce the amount of fossil fuels that are going into um, the heating and hot water of our buildings is an essential part of addressing our localized air quality. Uh, in addition to that, we consistently are working um, locally and region regionally through uh, DOT to, um, to look at this transition to electric vehicles, will also, which will also have a significant impact on our localized air quality <coughs> from the transportation sector. So you would be open to a number four oil phase out? I think that getting uh, moving away from, from fuel oil, um, it, as we've seen, is a very effective way to okay. deal with uh, air quality. Okay. So that's something we certainly have some legislation on and we look forward to working with you on. Um, wanted to go through your electric, your EVs. Um, so I think we set a goal of uh, 2,000 EV sedans being integrated into the system. Um, we're now at 1,030 that have been converted. Uh, how many do you anticipate this year will convert? I'd have to check on, on an actual, the, the, the final number for this year. I mean, we, we've significantly increased every year um, and also are kind of driving some of the local market of getting some of these new vehicles that are coming out online. So I can get back to you on exactly what the number is for this year. But yeah. we, are, uh, we are aggressively moving to, um, to meet our target early. Right, and then there's been some challenges in which we've heard from companies like EPS and others who want to go full EV. And there's been a lot of um, challenges around infrastructure. Can you speak to Absolutely. what are the thoughts? How are we going to expand opportunities? Sure. The uh, the real challenge is around charging. You know, being able to have the sufficient infrastructure for charging is essential for both last mile delivery as well as for private vehicle ownership and fleet ownership transitioning to electric vehicles. Uh, the mayor has committed um, uh, ten million dollars at first, and with additional uh, money coming to um, establish fast charging hubs throughout the city. The goal is to have about 50 fast charging hubs established uh, in the next few years, which would- Is that 50? 50, all, okay. throughout, all throughout the city, um, currently working on a, a roadmap to look at the distribution of that. And the goal there is to not just uh, move forward with, um, uh, with slower charging, which we're doing as well, it'll be 100 um, um, of, the, of the typical kind of level three chargers, but moving towards fast charging throughout the city where these hubs would allow for for both businesses as well as private owners um, to be able to charge more quickly. And we're also trying to change and normalize the behavior of moving over to electric vehicles. It's essential for both our vehicle emissions reductions as well as a, a transition um, to a more of a kind of shared mobility mo uh, program. And how, do you, how are you tying, so a lot of new development going on around the city. How are you working with HPD and others to sort of ensure that they're and obviously we've up updated our building codes, but around things like EV sure. charging stations, solar, geothermal, is there a close connection? Are we really working together strategically on ways to enhance more renewable energy. Absolutely. I, I mean, I think the best way to think about it is that these are all integrated systems. It's how do we move electrons around more effectively? And to do that, we have to attack it from several levels. Being able to uh, advocate and kind of put money behind additional charging is important to be able to you know, kind of change behavior. It's also important for work with our kind of private sector uh, partners to um, encourage them to switch over to electric vehicles. But it's also looking at how that works with the building system. A more efficient building um, usually has the ability to to look at um, how it better uses that electricity. That might come from storage, vehicle uh, electricity storage, but it also comes from having more charging options when the, when a vehicle uh, when a, um, a uh, a building is either being built or being retrofitted. We have currently on on the books a, a bill that allows for additional charging uh, conduit that is installed once a new parking goes into place. Okay. And we are actually working now on a, on a bill that would increase that significantly by requiring electric vehicle infrastructure to be um, installed in buildings when um, new spaces are added. 
And that, that's part of attacking this from all different sides and letting a building uh, better utilize and more flexibly utilize its energy uh, for the benefit of all. Uh, two more questions. So obviously environmental justice is important to this committee and the chairman has certainly taken this by the helm as well. I know Councilmember Inez Barron had also sponsored some legislation around this. Um, what are some of your strategies around addressing, you know, some of the more vulnerable communities such as Rockaway, Sunset Park, um, where, you know, low income residents exist? What is the strategy around ensuring that we can uh, address climate change? Uh, through an EJ lens. Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the, the major tenets is that when it comes to the, the impacts of climate change, they, uh, you know, we, need, we share in the burden, we also need to share in the benefits. Mm -hmm. So the ability to make sure that um, we are establishing not just a framework that is applicable to all, but also to make sure that everyone will benefit from a lot of the work that we're, being, we're doing. The, the building's mandate that um, uh, Chairperson Constantinides mentioned earlier is it, it does begin to address that work by making sure that we are kind of prioritizing um, a lot of our older building and, and the larger buildings, making sure that those buildings are operating more efficiently, and also by spurring on a significant amount of job growth in, in terms of uh, the actual work that's going to be needed to be able to, to retrofit those buildings. And we're, we're looking at upwards of 17,000 jobs that could be created as a result of moving forward on, on this, and we believe that that as well as additional efforts to kind of target areas around the city that may have been kind of historically underinvested and allow for us to really be thoughtful and as well as um, effectively tying together um, the, the work that we're doing around um, environmental and social justice as well as um, um, economic uh, and environmental attributes. All right, last question. Dan Zarelli, $145 million for the Rockaways. Where are we with Nothing all of the project? Oh, the, oh, <laughs> oh, you're going to speak. Okay, sorry, that's right. Sorry. Uh, we lived in the Rockaways then. <laughs> the projects have various schedules, but um, they're all expected to be completed uh, around 2021. 2021? That's right. Okay. And we're going to hear a little bit more as we... Sure, we can keep you updated as, okay. uh, as, as progress, uh, okay. as we make progress on those projects. All right, great. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank Councilmember you. Richards. Just very quickly, uh, before I hand it over to Councilmember Menchaca, um, what would you think about take transitioning um, your offices to an actual depart you know, department or agency, and and sort of? I think we'll, we'll get back to you on that. Charter review is that? And I, I think <laughs> just figure I'd, I'd ask. I, I think I knew the answer, but I think I'd ask that question as well. Uh, and at this point, I'll turn it over to Council Member uh, Carlos Menchaca. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you to the members of the committee. Um, and I also want to welcome you, Mr. Chambers, to this incredible uh, work that we're doing. Um, welcome. Thank you. So um, the I, I think I want to start with Amy, with Amy first. Uh, a lot of the work that, that you testified today really kind of shows a, a big Unless, is that on too? Yeah. That's off too? Okay, let's try again. Uh, hmm. I don't know if this is what's causing it. Okay. <laughs> are, are these solar powered? Uh, sharing. Or, or, uh, Sh sharing is sharing. Okay, sharing is sharing. Okay, let's try, let's try this, okay. <laughs> uh, great news. We're in the 90s in the percentage of work, and I, I just hope you feel proud. I know we, we do too. There's a lot of work that went into this. Um, yeah, hell yeah. Um, you deserve that work. Uh, you've been at the helm of this, uh, turning the ship around uh, in a lot of ways. It has not been easy. You got a lot of heat from everyone about this, and you and your team really kind of dedicated the right resources. And so I think the, the questions that I have um, beyond us going and, and touring, because I think that's gonna be an important part. We gotta, we gotta go see this work. Um, are there one or two places that would be important for us to kind of look at first uh, that you wanna talk about? I wanna give you the opportunity to do that. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I in anticipation, um, I think it was, I don't know who testified to this, but 
that the cost of of response tomorrow will be astronomically more than in 2012. So I I kind of want to get a sense from you about how we're how we're thinking about that. Uh, build it back is very specific in its in its program to literally build it back. But how how are we thinking in in in, in preparation? And in preparation. Yes. So thank you. Um, I think that one the the idea of the task force that we're jointly going to engage on is really important. And um, Janie and I, who are both on that task force, have had a lot of discussions about what we need to focus on in thinking. And we'd like it to be something that you know we could engage on and and have you know kind of completed by the next anniversary, which is in October. We're about to approach another hurricane season. Um, in terms of neighborhoods, there's so much unique about New York City and so much unique about what we've done, um, both in Coney Island, where we had huge challenges with attached homes and being able to get multiple homeowners to engage. We have some success stories where we actually have elevated homes um, and been able to do alternative mitigation for homeowners. Sheepshead Bay Courts is where um, a group of homeowners came together and formed a homeowners association to be able to make some improvements to an entire block. Um, but really, if you go to Edgemere and Arvern and the Rockaways um, and Staten Island, you can see blocks and blocks of homes where multiple homes have been elevated. I think in looking forward, the things that we think about and um, the rest of the country are thinking about, I mean, one of the um, horrible things that happened over the last couple of years is the additional hurricanes and other um, states across the country and in Puerto Rico. And so some of the things that we did after Sandy, like rapid repairs, which was a unique um, new program that had never been done anywhere else, has kind of been taken and, and redone in different communities. So I think we have an opportunity now both to think about um, build it back, but really to think about how all of the things, both from a preparedness before the storm, but then all of the benefits that come to homeowners that currently aren't in any way related, right? FEMA individual assistance, flood insurance, SBA loans, HUD, they're not related at all. How we can make sure that um, they're related and it's very clear what, how people can prepare themselves for a future storm and how we as a city can deliver the, the response that we need to respond. Got it. And, and I think the task force is the place where a lot of this is going to happen. And I'm really happy to know that that there's, in, in your testimony, or in your, and now in your question and answer, you really focus on all the other programs that are not, uh, not immediate to the response, but part of the larger conversation around flood insurance. Right. I know there's a lot of advocacy happening. I'm not going to concentrate on that, but I know that, that that's yeah. happening. Uh, great. So I'm looking forward to the tour and, and, and kind of seeing some of this work uh, and talking about it. I think we just need to talk about it because I, I think so much of what we saw in response and the lag time is still in the air and we got to just flush it out with real information and so I'm going to work with I want to work with you and the committee to make that make that happen um, and then I think well here's the other piece about about kind of build it back concept it's still it's still kind of designed around floods and rightly so I think but that's not all that could come in terms of climate change crisis moments we're talking about fires. We're talking about um, I, there's a lot of other things. Tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about it as you're as you're kind of transitioning through um, and what to expect. How 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 be specific? Yeah. So um, certainly on em emergency preparedness and, and disasters generally, that's something that New York City Emergency Management's focused on. Um, but yeah, um, in our office is the Housing Recovery Office, and so we're really looking at an overarching housing recovery plan um, for moving forward. And it can be a climate-related disaster, but it could be another disaster. And you know, while the city um, has faced disasters before and developed programs after them, um, and certainly deals with small housing emergencies very effectively, um, figuring out the ways to um, help homeowner homeowners. Um, prepare so that everyone knows what they need to have access to in case there is a disaster for their own particular home preparedness um, and then how we would provide shelter um, in the immediate aftermath and um, how we could help people how we could help restore housing depending on what the disaster is is something we're, we're all talking about 
Great. Looking forward to, to hearing more about that. Some general questions. Uh, this are, these questions are coming from Red Hook. Some of our uh, Red Hook folks watching from home. Um, so NYCHA had a voluntary emergency response. Uh, NYCHA had a voluntary emergency response form which with special needs. And it went from paper to online. And has that model been rolled out? Is there any, any update on, on how that's going, how that's getting rolled out? what the impact has been, and uh, where has it been? Is it citywide? Is it certain boroughs? Anybody have an update on that? I don't. We would have to. Uh, Are you aware of it, though? Um, I'm not aware of it. OK. It would be good for us to get an uh, answer on that. Sure. Um, also, uh, the emergency preparedness for Red Hook and, Re and Guanas and really all kind of public housing uh, we, we're noting that there are shor a shortage of IV bags in the mainland of America because of what's been happening in Puerto Rico. So there's, there's a lot of resources that were sent over and kind of de depleting or just using, I don't know if that's on your radar at all. I'm seeing some nods over here on your team. Um, can you give us a sense about what, what that looks like? Um, I've, worked on, I've worked on a lot of legislation with uh, Office of Emergency uh, uh, OEM management, and there's a lot of pushback for this. They're like, we got it. We know how to do it. Don't tell us how to do it. Um, but I'm unclear about whether or not OEM is ready and prepared in, in, in moments where we have been having to respond nationally in Puerto Rico, Houston, and whether or not we're ready here and have replenished our, our, our um, kind of emergency and resiliency items. Anybody? I know OEM isn't here, but. Right. Th this would be a question for, for okay. um, emergency management. Oh, uh, well, let's see, what else? Okay, uh, so last question on solar stuff. So I'm really happy that the chair really drilled down on the larger concepts around solar and embedding it into all the work we're doing. Hundreds of millions of dollars are coming to Sunset Park uh, under a really great opportunity that the community has been bold about and demanding for resources. Brooklyn Army Terminal just released a re uh, an RFP, so it sounds like it's on your radar. Um, to bring possible solar farm to the rooftops of, of the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Um, thinking about NYCHA and the half a billion dollars that's coming to Red Hook, and we went with another kind of power plant concept. Uh, some folks said we should have gone solar instead of. So how, how, can we, how can we bring information to communities so that they can really push for this? Because th th they're pushing on the ground. But we're, we're saying no. And I kind of want to get a sense about what's causing the no and and where we can move that to a yes, uh, especially with with bigger with a big multi-million dollar projects. And then I'm going to add another piece to that, which is ULERPs. There's a lot of ULERPs that are are potentially on their way. In Sunset Park, there's something called Industry City. I don't know if you've ever been there, um, but it's pretty massive. It's six million square feet of property, and they're considering proposing an opportunity to change the zoning. Uh, would you? join us in that conversation to figure out how we can create community capacity to think about this when we have that conversation? Short answer is yes. Um, I, I think we're, we are committed to um, everything you said around being able to not just increase access, but also increase awareness. I think I mentioned Solarize NYC, which was uh, is something that uh, I'd love to come talk to you a little bit more about, um, is a great opportunity for communities to do just what, what you're suggesting. Um, additionally, I think it's important, though, that we also uh, mention that solar is extremely important. It's one tool in the toolkit. Um, we, we actually need everything on deck. You know, it's solar as well as significant demand reduction. So being able to to work to get more distributed generation, but also um, working to make sure that uh, buildings are operating more efficiently are all important pieces and, and critical to doing that. One final note, schools. There are six schools coming to District 38. Uh, more schools are getting, more seats are getting built in my district than anywhere in the city. That's due to the organizing that's happening on the ground and parents and kids and everyone's asking for an addressing the overcrowded school issue. And I just haven't heard anything about solar for any of these new schools that are coming. And, and so that, that just worries me that there's no synergy that's real and at the front of a lot of this work. So I'm hoping to work with you on making sure that every investment has every kind of community investment. Oh, participatory budgeting. By the way, uh, pbnyc.org, you can go vote. Uh, it's vote week uh, until Sunday. Woo! There's a lot of love for it here. Including all y'all, if you live, have you voted? Any of you voted yet? Do you know? Okay, 
Par participatory budgeting. Okay. If you don't have a council member that is participating in, per in PB, write them a letter um, and advocate. But PB projects is another place where we can bring solar stuff. And it'd be great to work with you to figure out PB size projects. Um, we're pushing the mayor to do matching with PB so that if we put a million, the mayor should put in five. That's the matching that we're talking about uh, for capital, that we can actually start thinking about some of these bigger projects that are community-based and, and get, get that imagination in these, these spaces where kids are designing the future. And they go to, they go to solar, but then we, we come with a price tag of a million or two million dollars for a project, and it's not possible. So I'd love to work with you and, and bring you on board to our advocacy campaign. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you. Carlos, that's an awesome idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to work on this together. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited about that. I, I have a few more questions to ask. Um, so when it comes to resiliency, I know that FEMA has put in uh, millions of dollars um, to uh, build, you know, to sort of reinforce those buildings that were affected by, by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I know in my particular neighborhood, I, I think we've spoken about this uh, in private, but like Howitz Cove Peninsula, you know, Storia houses, uh, eight, of the st eight of buildings there were affected by Sandy. They're getting resiliency treatments. The other eight buildings, the other buildings there on the campus, because they did not have flooding, are not getting those same treatments. Uh, so if, if there were to be a future storm, those buildings would be in, in a very bad way, where the other buildings, we've just made them resilient. How do we, how do we find the monies? Because I know these, these, that's the real challenge, right, is, is, is finding these real dollars to do these. How do we, f what's our plan to find those monies uh, to make sure that we're, we're, we're making all of our, our, our public housing and, and neighborhoods resilient? and not just those that we're getting those FEMA dollars for that were already affected. I, I, I'm not even giving, I'm not giving the easy one. I don't have the answer. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, th this is, it's, it's an incredibly important question. And um, part of the answer is that the way federal funds flow for resilience projects is broken. Uh, Absolutely. They, they, the way we, we get federal money in a very reactive way, but we need to be doing proactive work. Um, in the meantime, as I mentioned before, we're, we're trying to make sure that we're not just thinking about resilience projects in a silo, that every time we do substantial rehab or new construction, um, th that money is going towards building a more resilient city. Um, and you know, we'll have to think creatively about alternative financing schemes. And, um, and you know, we're, we've started some conversations with uh, private sector partners around that. There is no silver bullet, but um, we're completely committed to continuing to explore um, creative solutions. I, mean, I know in, in, in Western Queens, you have the Astoria Houses, the Ravenswood Houses, the Queensbridge Houses, all along the waterfront there. And uh, you know, some were uh, you know, affected by Sandy in a very real way. Some uh, were, were affected but not, you know, did not lose power, but their buildings weren't flooded, but still affected by Sandy. And how do, you know, just the real question is how do we ensure that our, our public housing residents, our communities, uh, low-income communities, communities of color are protected, uh, those that are most vulnerable, right? That, that's what at the forefront of what we're trying to do. That's right, and we share those goals. Uh, so looking at, um, going back to schools for a second, uh, what is the average cost of a renewable energy project uh, in a school or, or, or city-owned building? I'm going to have to come back to you on, on doing an actual average. I mean, I think it's important to understand that there are different ways to finance um, mm -hmm. solar, uh, particularly a renewable energy project on, on, a, on, a, project on a building, particularly a school. Um, so we, I'd happy to come back to you and talk to you about whether or not it's you're capitalizing the cost or whether or not you are using some other kind of power purchase agreement. And how do we work? How, do we, how can we better work together with agencies like School Construction Authority um, to make it achievable? I mean, I mean Carl Councilman Manchaka talked about that. and. You know, I definitely want to do more solar uh, in my schools this year. I'm, you know, I've, I'm, I have my own capital budget, but when I look at the price tag to do that, it, it's out of the range of, you know, doing one school, you have 17 schools in your district, it, it would take me uh, uh, longer than I have in office to get that done. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we work with the agencies to make those affordable up front so we can make these investments in partnership between the council members, the borough presidents, uh, and, and, the, and your offices as well? I mean, I think it's a conversation we'd love to have. It, it, again, it's important to, to make sure that looking at different financial models is going to be the way to make that money stretch further because mm -hmm. um, you're not just investing in the actual uh, panels themselves, but you're also uh, 
they're the, the energy that they're producing. And being able to utilize that energy for the building itself or for sharing it um, is part of how you're able to distribute those costs. So I'm happy to have that conversation. I'd love to have that conversation with you because I mean, as, our, as we're sitting there going through the city budget, I think it's important for us to uh, see how we can best do this work together because we have a bo whole bunch of schools and, and city-owned buildings that are on our list for solar readiness. And it's like, how do we take that from where they are um, that they are solar ready to actually implementing solar a, a, in a more quick basis in all partnerships. Yeah, and I think, I think power purchase agreements are one of the, the key ways in order to be able to do that uh, quickly, and so we can have that conversation. And, and I know this is not an education committee hearing, um, but I'll ask the question anyway, but um, as we implement uh, these renewable energy projects, whether it's geothermal, whether it's solar, whether it's other wind, um, if it's at a school or a library or a place where people gather, how do we, is, is there a curriculum? Are we creating opportunities um, working with the Department of Education to uh, educate our children about you know, what solar is and, and why it's important it's on our buildings? Because they're going to be the ones who are going to lead this city uh, uh, in the future. So are we making those partnerships in the DOE to make that part of the, the science curriculums? Absolutely. D DOE has a kind of very um, active sustainability program in which they are looking to make a lot of those synergies happen within their offices. Additionally, uh, we work with them to be able to use the, um, the, the mantle of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability to be able to um, promote a lot of the same um, visions, the same education throughout. Mm -hmm. We have a program called Green YC, um, which uh, is really the public education and outreach arm of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, and working with the uh, Department of Education is exactly the, uh, the type of synergy that we look forward to and, and be able to be able to make sure we're pushing messages out uh, to the public that are consistent. So you're seeing it at school, but you're also seeing it online and you're seeing it in other places. Are, are, they, is, 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 are they going to PTAs? Are they going to community boards? How, do, how can we better connect uh, you know, with families and, and so they're understanding what's going on in, their, in their, their children's schools and can get better educated themselves? So happy to have that conversation. There's a lot of different ways and outreach um, that we're doing, but also outreach that is more outreach that's possible. The more people that are asking questions and the more um, places in which we can be, uh, again, both physically and virtually, allow mm -hmm. for uh, uh, both um, kind of parents as well as students as well as neighbors to be able to uh, look f to how they can better um, utilize their particular environment uh, towards their benefit. So we're happy to have that conversation and happy to work with you on that. And I'm, I'm not sure if my colleagues have asked this question yet, but we know, you know the, the governor's talked about Indian Point going offline uh, in the near future. Um, how do we ensure that uh, we're ready for that and not just putting more uh, stock in uh, a sort of unclean grid, right? It, you know, it, we don't, we don't want to have the peaker plants uh, throughout our city just be turned on more often. Mm -hmm. um, how are we working to ensure that uh, we are going to have a cleaner source of energy uh, as Indian Point goes offline? So it's a great question. I think, I think when in last year in January when the governor announced that um, Indian Point um, would be um, plans, plans to retire as early as 2021, um, it definitely raised some concerns. And I think the mayor was consistent then and has continued to be consistent um, uh, that any closure plan for Indian Point really should address uh, New York City's you know, reliability of energy and cost you know, local emissions as well as greenhouse gas emissions. So we are, we are concerned with what, um, what does come to replace uh, Indian Point, and we are using the opportunity to advocate um, primarily for transmission into the city, um, making sure that <coughs> any renewables that we're also advocating for can actually get to the, to the city, mm -hmm. and that we're able to have reliable energy throughout that time period as we transition from our current energy sources to renewables, and particularly offshore wind as well as upstate solar, upstate hydro, things along those lines. Are there things that we can do as a city um, that maybe aren't reliant on the state to get those things done, or, or, or are we kind of at the mercy of, of this partnership with them? No, I mean, I think that as with our, um, as we talked before about um, kind of working on, the, on the, the federal government, I mean, more cooperation is better. I, right. think that I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, but we are actively trying to use our purchase power, purchasing power, to be able to guide the market, and also working with the with NYSERDA and state, as well as um, the uh, New York Independent State Operator, to make sure that we're prioritizing the actual components that will let us get access to that power and actually be able to use it in the city simultaneously. Again, the demand reduction in the city is going to be critical to us being able to. 
manage changes that are outside of our control with changes that are within our control. So reducing the demand that the building sector is um, is demanding out of uh, out of the energy sources is really our number one strategy to be able to uh, reduce emissions, and it's the largest impact we can have right now. Because I know, I mean, you know, again, frame of reference, my own district, right? I, I ha we have power. We have 55% of the city's power coming from Western Queens, both my district and Councilmember Van Bramers, with uh, Ravenswood uh, you know, plant there. You have uh, NRG. You have uh, Story of Gen. Uh, you know those peaker plants when they click on. Uh, you know, the closer you get to those power plants, the higher the asthma rates. Uh, and there's no, there's a, there's a direct correlation there. I mean, folks will try to make different, uh, uh, I, I'll draw that straight line. I don't need to have you guys to do it, but I'll, I'll say that the closer you get to those power plants, um, the higher the asthma rates are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and asthma has a real effect on our communities. So I think I don't want to see those plants clicked on any more than they have to be. And I, I, I completely agree. I think we're, we're actively working to... All right. Um, so, I, any other questions, guys? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I, I, I was just really happy that the, the chair is really focusing on this kind of larger, larger piece about schools. And, and one thing I want to inject as we move forward is, um, or are all the economic development opportunities and training the future workforce. And so this is this is all this is even like in building back and making sure that th this is all going to have to get built by people. And they need to be built by our people, New Yorkers, um, and especially uh, minority women businesses, uh, public housing residents. And, and so I'm really hoping that we can work together on a plan that already is out there piecemeal. And when we think about Sunset Park, for example, with some, one of the, the largest portfolio of city-owned property that's getting investment, and we're thinking about green or uh, uh, kind of resiliency infrastructure, that we bring, that we, th there's a real connection between the jobs and and this new technology and um, and the training uh, and working with our unions. And so that's, that's already, I, I don't wanna open that up too much other than that as, as a member of the committee and uh, with the support of the chair, I'd like to continue to work on and think about that and measure our success and to be able to say, this is what we're doing and this is, this is how we're gonna do it. It, just one thing to add to that, because I think we completely agree in connecting people to the jobs that are being created is, is immensely important, and connecting New Yorkers to these jobs is immensely important. So we can, we are, right now, you can go into the Workforce One Centers, um, and we have a partnership with Building Trades, and so we're screening people to be able to take advantage of um, pre-apprenticeship training programs that we're willing to pay for um, that ultimately puts them on the path towards apprenticeships and to careers in the construction trades. And so that already exists. We would love your help in helping to spread the word on that. And then the final question, um, with the Green NYC program, um, what happened to uh, the birdie? <laughs> Is this the first time this public hearing has been able to happen since you guys Kill the bird. <laughs> so no, seriously, what happened? No, no, I'm getting yeah. a lot of calls on this. By fair, the way. fair enough. I mean, I uh, we are we are happy that that everyone is is in, is invested in in um, outreach and education ar around a lot of the things that Green NYC is focused on. Uh, Birdie is alive and well. Um, We're glad to hear Birdie that. Birdie is still an employee of um, of the city <laughs> as, as and he mind. he remains the uh, the mascot of of Green NYC oh, program. It, I mean, th th there was nothing that ever happened to Birdie. I think oh, it was. Really? I think that <laughs> it was. It was strictly. Uh, I did not realize it was a rumor. Okay, yeah, else. I'm really happy <laughs> to know that. Birdie, Birdie flies are greatly exaggerated. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for. This is why we have public hearings. Bird, Birdie exists. Ah. Oh, yeah, birds on it. Ah. <laughs> You're just. Okay. But, but I mean, I think one thing, is one thing is important to say is that we have to reach all, you know, 8.6 million um, residents of this city. And some of them want to be reached through Birdie. Some of them want to be reached through other channels. And we're going to leave no stone. We could increase the family. Exactly. Amen to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have tw two last questions. One on Green NYC. Uh, what is the budget um, for the outreach? So uh, the budget is, it, it's, thank you spread over some time, but it's about a million dollars. Okay, and and that's for a set citywide? Yes. Th that's for citywide outreach and-, and so For, within with, within Green NYC program. Within Green NYC. Other, so as with zero by 30 and with other, um, um, like, s 
agency programs that are aligned with Green YC, mm -hmm. they also have budgets, but for particularly for the management of the Green YC program, it's been Could we use more? Anything that helps to increase um, awareness and anything that helps move us further in our pathway towards 80 by 50 is, would be great. Okay, and that's my last question. Jenny, I'm not gonna leave you out. So uh, as we're getting uh, millions of billions of dollars uh, in recovery and resiliency funding, pro uh, funding um, you know, from, the f you know, from the federal government, uh, as more of these projects come online, uh, is the city budgeting appropriately for long-term maintenance? Uh, Long-term maintenance is certainly on our radar. Um, we haven't actually gone through a budgeting process um, for some of these uh, new coastal protection projects that uh, are, are not online yet, but, it, but uh, we, uh, our colleagues at OMB are well aware that um, that is a, uh, will be a need and um, we will certainly uh, budget appropriately uh, as these projects come online. All right, great. Well, I, I appreciate uh, all of your testimonies today. I look forward to our partnerships. I'm so glad to hear it was fake news that Bertie is no was 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 injured in any way. Um, but I, I really, in, in all seriousness, appreciate your time and your partnership, and look forward to doing a lot more together. Thank Same you. Same here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we have our next panel. Uh, uh, please step forward, Gabriella uh, Gabriella Velarde Ward. Uh, Rachel Epstein, Isabel Silverman, and Catherine Hughes. If you all step forward, please. All right, if we could start here on the left. Is that on? Yeah, there it is. Um, this is very encouraging, but I want to emphasize a particular case of proactive, proactivity or no proactivity. Um, my name is Gabriella Velarde Ward, and I live across the street from the Graniteville Wetland Forest, uh, and it's my home and the home of many of my neighbors um, that are in jeopardy of being flooded because the forest and wetland across the street from us is in danger of being cut down and filled in. And a big um, uh, box door, a gas station, a uh, parking lot for 835 cars and two other very large buildings are going to go there if we can't stop it. Uh, I'm familiar with the good work of the Mayor's Office on Sustainability has done in the past, and let me explain that. I was, I worked for the Park Department for 23 years as an architectural designer in capital projects, as an architectural designer and as construction supervisor, and um, I was the Park's representative to the Mayor's Office of Construction for Sustainable Construction in the late 1990s. So I was in on the ground. By now it's evident that sustainability alone is not sufficient. It's failed because we have not done enough fast enough. So now we must seek resilience as a last resort. I applaud your desire and political will to prioritize resilience if resilience also means prevention of flooding before it occurs and does not mean after the fact resilience, after the damage is done resilience, after people's lives are destroyed resilience. Today I'm here to represent the environmental justice community of Graniteville in Staten Island. In the last few years, Staten Island has lost much of its natural resilience. And now, Graniteville is in danger of losing its wetland forest, which is, if not stopped, will become a South Avenue retail project. The Graniteville wetland forest saved this community during Hurricane Sandy. We were not flooded. <coughs> if we lose the wetland, uh, we will lose our property and maybe even our lives. We're very close to Arthur Hill, and um, if we have no, no buffer between uh, Arthur Hill and us. So let me ask, why is it that New York City has approved the destruction of this free and natural resilient buffer against disaster? 
Why is it that New York City has allowed the destabilization of this environmental justice community in the name of profits? Why is it um, that this toxically overburdened community is going to lose the only resilience it has? Why is it that no one seems to care if Graniteville is flooded in the coming years? And be assured, it is not a matter of if we are flooded, it is when we are flooded. Why is it that no one cares that the loss of the only open green space we have, the wetland forest, will leave us defenseless in the face of rising tides? Why is it that no one cares that profits at lar of large corporations are prioritized over the lives of people? Why is it that all of this is okay because it's legal? And then let us ask why this is happening in an area that has a majority of black and brown people. The days of development on wetlands are gone. Climate change is not going to happen in 50 years. It's happening now. In fact, this morning I heard that the Gulf Stream is at, uh, at its weakest in 1,600 years. If we lose the Gulf Stream, we're in severe danger. Western Europe will be, we'll go back to the Ice Age and, and the East Coast of the United States will be in real trouble. So that's, that's the latest. Uh, it's happening now. I applauded the prior prioritization of sustainability coming from the mayor's office over 20 years ago. The decrease in our carbon footprint is laudable. LEED was meant to encourage developers to put sustainability first, and that came out of the committee that I was on. I did not, it did not work. It de didn't do enough early enough and fast enough. We need to acknowledge that nature has the best system of protection. We must protect the wetlands that still exist. We must create new wetlands, marshes, and oyster beds. We must leave the forest alone. Have we learned anything from last year's severe hurricanes? There must be regulation to prohibit the construction of anything, public or private. That's the big elephant in the living room, the private sector. They have to, be, uh, they have to conform to the regulations of the, pub of the public sector also. Because if you're doing one thing and they're doing another, you're, you're losing. Um, the public and private on wetlands, no grandfathering in, no exceptions, no approval of environmental, in, environmental impact statements without serious consideration of climate change and the damage the project will cause to people's lives. There can be no pro forma approvals any longer. We need to take these steps if we are to survive. We can no longer have out of control development and growth. In the human body, out of control growth is called cancer. We humans are acting like a cancer spreading throughout the earth, forcing the inhabitants of small islands to relocate because the oceans are rising and gobbling up the, the land. And I want to inform everybody in New York City, not only those here, Staten Island is a small island. We're in trouble. Not just the south and east shore, the whole north shore, and especially the northwest shore where Graniteville is. Property rights cannot be sacrosanct when those rights destroyed people's lives. How do we stop the madness? How do we get off this moving train? Let's heed the warnings and act to protect the vulnerable in the city, which I've heard a lot about today. No matter who they are, where they live, by saving our wetlands, marshes, and forests, let us act to prevent flooding in Graniteville. Let us act to protect our natural resiliency. Staten Island gets lost in the shuffle a lot. Staten Island is not an urban center. It's not a com an urban community. It's very uh, suburban in a lot of ways, and it needs to keep its wetlands and marshes and forests. It needs to keep them because we need it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rachel Eve Stein, and I'm the Deputy Director for Sustainability and Resiliency at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Um, I'd like to thank Committee Chair Constantinidis and the members of the Environmental Protection Committee for holding today's hearing on the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and the Office of Recovery and Resiliency. The Center promotes and protects affordable home ownership in New York so that middle and working class families are able to build strong, thriving communities. Our focus on flood resiliency, disaster recovery, and long-term sustainability stems from our homeowner recovery efforts following Hurricane Sandy. When Sandy struck, our homeowner services expertise and strong relationships with community groups in impacted neighborhoods allowed us to respond quickly and focus on both the short and long-term needs of homeowners. Over the last three years, we have expanded the center's climate resiliency resources and programs for homeowners. Today, we offer the following services. Flood insurance information. 
FloodHealthNY.org is a first-of-its-kind web platform that engages and informs homeowners about how they can protect their homes from rising sea levels and how to lower their flood insurance rates, increase literacy of flood insurance and resiliency issues, and connects them to related tools and services from the center. Resiliency audits and counseling. For qualifying homeowners, we also offer resiliency audits and counseling through the Residential Technical Assistance Pilot Program. To participate, homeowners must meet income thresholds and live in one of the following New York rising neighborhoods. Canarsie, Gravesend, Bensonhurst, Bergen Beach, Georgetown, Marine Park, Mill Basin, Mill Island, Red Hook, Rockaway East, Howard Beach, and Lower Manhattan. Recently, we expanded to include Coney Island, Brighton Beach, Seagate, Manhattan Beach, Gerritsen Beach, and Sheepshead Bay. Eligible homeowners receive a free home resiliency audit and elevation certificate, altogether valued at about $1,800. The homeowners are then scheduled for a housing counseling session at a nearby community-based organization to discuss flood insurance options and financing for resiliency retrofits. Flood insurance and home resiliency retrofits are highly technical and complicated topics, which is why the free expert assistance provided through this program is invaluable to homeowners. We thank all of the city council members who helped us understand the needs of their constituents and have been crucial to getting the word out about our services. We look forward to working with you on future events. Backwater valves. In addition to the home resiliency audits and counseling services, we are expanding our services to provide free backwater valve installations for qualified homeowners in Coney Island, Brighton Beach, Seagate, Manhattan Beach, Gerritsen Beach, Sheepshead Bay, and Howard Beach. Uh, backwater valves help reduce flood damage by preventing sewer, sewer backflow, which can save homeowners thousands of dollars in property damage and cleanup. I should also mention it is in Canarsie as well. Um, foreclosure prevention and homeowner stabilization services. Along with these specialized services, the center continues to offer high quality foreclosure prevention, housing counseling, and legal services to homeowners throughout New York City. Thanks to generous support uh, from the city council, we also provide specialized service for senior homeowners, including estate planning and scam prevention. Our partnership with the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency has been essential to the success of Flood Help NY services. Their marketing and outreach support have helped us reach our audience of coastal communities. They were crucial to the success of our home resiliency art audit. ORR provided technical assistance throughout the design phase and have continued to give us expert guidance as we design the residential backwater valve installation program. We are committed to supporting the city's 80 by 50 energy reduction goals through our energy sustainability programming. Last year, the center was awarded funding from NYSERDA for the Community Energy Engagement Program, or SEEP for short, uh, which provides New Yorkers with technical and financial guidance to implement energy efficiency and renewable energy retrofitting projects. The center has coordinated with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability to ensure both homeowners and multifamily building owners get the support they need to make cost saving and energy saving retrofits. To that end, we send multifamily leads to their retrofit accelerator program and they direct homeowners to us. We think engaging homeowners is critical to the city's energy reduction goals. Homeowners are in a unique position to adopt energy retrofits because they have control over the structure and use of their property, but still face a number of technical and financial barriers. We are dedicated to overcoming these barriers with New York homeowners and hope to work with MOS on this endeavor. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to working with you to promote resiliency while preserving affordability in our flood prone neighborhoods. Thank you. Isabel? Okay, no, <coughs> now it's on. Good afternoon, Chair Constantinidis and staff. My name is Isabel Silverman and I'm a senior fellow at Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm gonna leave out EDF. I mean, EDF is a not-for-profit organization. I think you know that. We have mm -hmm. 35,000 uh, members in New York City and over two million in the country. Over the past few years, EDF has worked closely with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability on several important sustainability issues, such as the Clean Heat Initiative, the Retrofit Accelerator, the Mayor's Carbon Challenge, large building retrofit mandates, electric vehicles, and other energy and environmental issues. We appreciate the productive working relationship and open dialogue we have with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and are encouraged by the discipline and focus behind their efforts. EDF supports the Mayor's Office um, of Sustainability's work and wants to see them succeed in achieving the city's goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. 
Um, as per New York City's reports, the 1.5 degree report aligning New York City with the Paris Climate Agreement and New York City's roadmap map to 8550, MOS has been declared the lead agency for the vast majority <coughs> of key actions that will help move us towards the 8550 goal. Implementing and overseeing the different key actions and programmatic goals will be challenging to say the least and will require resources beyond what is currently allocated. The city should take every step to make sure uh, that MOS is ad <coughs> adequately staffed and funded to advance the daunting task of decarbonizing the city over the next 30 years. Major collaboration and coordination across various agencies, which is the key function of MOS, will be necessary to achieve the city's ambitious goals. At the same time, the mayors of uh, you know, the MOS will need to st stay at the forefront and of upcoming sustainability issues and opportunities. We only have 32 years to get this right and avoid costly major sea level rises. Without adequate funding and staffing, MOS success will be hampered. And then regarding the mayor's management report, um, the city should include MOS's performance in the mayor's management report. It should analyze MOS and other city agencies' performance and progress towards the city, city's 80 by 50 goal. I did a little search in the MMR mayor's management report. There was nothing about greenhouse gas emissions or sustainability, work, uh, searching for these words. And yet, that's probably the most difficult, one of the most difficult tasks we'll have over the next 30 years. The city should also track the financial costs to the city of um, New York of rising temperatures, extreme weather events, and rising sea levels on an ongoing basis. And then I just wanted to mention briefly uh, what you said about asthma. Of course, the phase out of number four heating oil helps tremendously mm -hmm. by combating, of course you know that, and we'll, we'll be k happy to help with that, advance that. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> these buildings really didn't have to do anything so far. They just stayed. Or they went from six to four oil, which wasn't a big deal. So now it's their turn to help clean up our air and keep us healthier. And then um, I think also they're implementing rules that are going to be redone for Local 87. And those can also help us uh, towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Everybody's talking about that eventually about 60% of buildings will have to go to heat pumps, electric heat pumps, and move away from burning fossil fuels in their basement uh, to generate heat and domestic hot water. So it would be very helpful to have some pilot projects on that because the real estate industry is a little hesitant to do it in large multifamily buildings or commercial buildings that hasn't really done, been done enough in the city more single family homes so that the city would be very helpful if the city could help with pilot projects for heat pumps. And then what you said about the peaker plants being turned off in the, turned on in the summer, I think it's so sad that if you think about it, so much electricity is probably just being wasted in the city by air conditioning down to 67 degrees and and, and, and air conditioning being on when people are not even there, lights being on, and then we turn on these peaker plants for basically to waste the uh, energy, so I mean, that's sad. The retrofit mandates you're working on, one of the ideas EDF has is, as we have a minimum temperature in the, during heating season, the 68 degrees that we have to provide to tenants, mm -hmm. maybe we should also look at a maximum temperature in the heating season. So let's say 78 degrees, and if they go consistently over that temperature and overheat consistently, which causes great discomfort, obviously, to residents when they can't turn off their radiators, that then the landlords are confronted with looking at their heating system and how to balance it better to avoid overheating and underheating. Um, that, uh, that tenants could actually file a complaint with the city when there is overheating and underheating. Um, so, th of course, we're looking at all of that and then set a 2050 goal so the real estate industry knows where we eventually want them to go to, you know, electrification. So thank you very much, and of course we're available for questions. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Kostin-Louise. Um, 
My name is Catherine McVeigh Hughes. I served 20 years as Manhattan Community Board one chair, half that time as chair and vice chair. And after Superstorm Sandy, I was appointed co-chair of the New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program for Southern Manhattan. So I just want to go over a couple key points here. Um, you. As you know, 2017 was the costly, costliest year ever for weather and climate disasters in the United States, totaling $306 billion. Moody's, uh, a major credit rating agency, has added climate to credit risks and now warns cities to address their climate exposure or face rating downgrades. And FEMA, the future of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and its federal flood insurance program is uncertain, and FEMA's flood insurance premiums are to rise this year. They are slated to expire at the end of this July, 2018, and FEMA is more than $25 billion in debt. We do not know if or how much the federal government will assist in rebuilding our communities. If there's another Sandy, it was only a superstorm, it wasn't even Hurricane One. Um, so the Hurricane Sandy Recovery Task Force, can we get a status update on that? I asked some of my elected officials and I, I never heard back on this. The members of this task force were to be appointed by the mayor and the city council speaker within 120 days of the enactment of this local law. This deadline has already passed. In addition, the task force was to submit to the mayor and the speaker report no later than 12 months. It should be an update it should also include an update on the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Project. You have the map here, known as LMCR, which includes CB1's segment south of Brooklyn Bridge, including the historic South Street Seaport and the Financial District. You know, Lower Manhattan is an island too, and we feel left out, just like Staten Island. Um, FIDI is the fourth largest business district in the country and where one out of every 18 citywide jobs is located, according to our local business improvement district bid. Um, LMCR is in the planning phase with a budget total to be determined and a completion date to be determined. Okay, um, as you know, I'm also a member of the New York Harbor Regional Storm Surge Barrier Working Group. Um, we need to construct a layered defense of local seawalls and regional New York Harbor storm surge system um, so it could address future storm surges. A 20 to 25 foot high offshore storm surge barrier system. And I have a diagram in the testimony so you can see it here. So this is the circle of protection. Um, would one, avoid the complex hydrogeological built infrastructure and social infrastructure issues faced by the current dual purpose SUR and RVD projects. Two, could protect the metro area for the next 100 years, allowing for long-term change. Three, would protect far more communities than the current SUR and RVD projects for the same $20 billion cost, about the cost of one $19 billion Sandy type storm that was in 2012. Um, the social justice case for the Metropolitan New York, New Jersey Regional Storm Surge Barrier System has been demonstrated in a recently published environmental law in New York, developments in federal and state law. Um, for disclosure purposes, I'm one of the five authors on that. It highlights and maps the low and middle income communities and communities of color suffer more from Sandy and its aftermath than wealthier neighborhoods. The same communities also experience slower and less effective rebuilding efforts. The circle of protection defends diverse income and racial groups at lower costs and with better outcomes than local community-based barriers such as are currently being planned. The regional st storm surge barrier is one of five alternatives currently being considered by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributaries, known as HATS, Coastal Storm Risk Feasibility Study. Alternative two has the perimeter defenses only addressing sea level rise and building a regional storm surge barrier to address the threat of storm surge. This would shorten the coastline, you heard it's over 500 miles, just on the New York City side, and provide a comprehensive protection for the entire region. It has historic support. 
and it is currently um, alternative to and the tentatively selected plan, and I hope that this committee will hold a hearing on it and support it as well. Uh, the Mayor's Management Report, MMR. The city must track the financial cost of climate change and add indicators to capture sea level rise, energy use, and greenhouse gas emissions. The 372-page preliminary 218 MMR annual report was released in February 2018 and fails to reflect the city's targets and goals to meet its C40 commitment by 2020 and its 80 by 2050 target. This document needs to be updated to include indices that are annually measured and publicly shared so that the progress can be monitored and evaluated going forward. Also, Local Law 22 of 2008 requires a 30% reduction in citywide greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and requires annual inventory and analysis of greenhouse gas emissions by the city government emissions by 2017. You know, we heard some numbers being bantered around and I just wanted you to see on this document that the city produced last fall on page 43, the citywide annual greenhouse gas emissions, it's been steady. It, if you just look at the chart from 2005, so 2016, 2020, uh, 2015, 2014, 2013, it's pretty stable there. So we've had the 15% in the first 10 years, but how are we gonna get to the 80 by 2050? And this committee, you have the answers and the power to make sure that we're, this city does not, you know, that we stay above water. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you all for your testimony. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, Margarita Ermeyer, uh, Buck Moorhead, Judith Weiss, and uh, Diana uh, Switas. I'm gonna ask everyone, I, I don't wanna use the clock today, but I'm also gonna ask you to be very succinct. So if you can just make sure that your testimony is succinct today, I, I don't wanna have to use a clock and, and let's do this together, so I appreciate that. Lisa, I, 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 I got you as well. Yep, I got you. You're coming up next. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, if you can start there on the left. Uh, make sure you push the button. Make sure it shows yep. red there. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I hear you now. All uh, right. My name is Judith Weiss. I'm a professor emerita at Rutgers University. I'm a marine biologist, and I would like to comment on uh, shoreline structures, which are in the works since we've got sea level rise and and hurricanes and so forth. There are all kinds of ways of uh, protecting shorelines and they have different effects on the animals that live in the water. Um, in terms of the marine life, clearly a natural shoreline, a marsh such as a uh, woman who was testifying before whose marsh is threatened. Marshes are, are ideal, they provide habitat for a variety of marine animals, for birds and other land animals and wildlife. The salt marshes also sequester a lot of pollutants, including heavy metals, including nitrogen, that's a pollutant problem for nutrient pollution, including carbon dioxide, which is the cause of the sea level rise in the first place. Um, so marshes also provide, to a degree, protection for residents living behind it, as, as she said before. Um, enhanced salt marshes it would be very unlikely to say, and I wouldn't say, if we had more marshes, we wouldn't have had all the problems from Sandy. Sandy would have topped over marshes. Uh, uh, so um, it, it's clear we would benefit from more, more marshes and enhanced marshes, but 
marshes alone are not going to protect us from something of the magnitude of Sandy. Um, there are a variety of different kinds of hardened shorelines, and on the reverse side of the paper you have, I hope you have it, um, uh, <laughs> on the back side there are some photos, right. Um, so not all hardened and modified shorelines are equivalent. Um, there are some, there are, are relatively new experiments going on. It's more than experiments. It's, it's, it's trying out and, and apparently working pretty well. Something called living shorelines, which are in areas where the shoreline of a marsh is getting eroded and the sea level rise is affecting it and, and it's clearly eroding inward. You put some large, either large boulders in the seaward side of the marsh, or you can put oysters, something hard. Oysters is certainly ideal. You have a double benefit from having oysters there. Uh, and it, it is going to protect the marsh from the erosion that's happening from the sea level rise. And I would like to recommend to you a book that came out last year called Living Shorelines, and it's the first one in, in the references that I've provided. These are uh, articles about all sorts of kinds of living shorelines, and I recommend that book to you heartily as giving you the background as you have to deal with considering these issues. Uh, there's also what is prevalent along the Hudson River. It's called riprap which are big boulders along the edge of the slope. Uh, and, and that's what, what is mostly along the Upper West Side uh, Hudson River coastline. And um, it turns out that riprap is much better than a, hard, than, than a seawall. Riprap is almost as good as a natural shoreline in terms of uh, the number of organisms and the diversity of organisms that can live there. Another relatively, um, le let me say, less destructive um, approach is a breakwater, which is a kind of a wall, but it's not right at the shoreline. It's out in the water a bit. And this is one of the, uh, the things planned for the, I believe it's the southern coast of Staten Island that they would have these breakwaters, which is also um, not that bad because it's not totally, er it's not er eradicating the intertidal zone, which is what a seawall does. A seawall comes right up, and you've got the land on the one side and the water on the other side, and you have no longer an intertidal zone. And the intertidal zone is um, th this you know, myriads of creatures that live in the intertidal zone and their habitat is totally gone if you put a wall right at the edge. If you put the wall out in the water, they still have their intertidal zone. Uh, so the last one I wanted to mention are um, bulkheads or seawalls, which is a very common thing that urban communities have, and that's the kind where your intertidal zone is gone altogether, and it's by far the least conducive to marine life. But there have been some, um, some experiments, uh, and, and it's written up in one of the chapters in that book, um, about what the city of Seattle did with their seawall. A seawall doesn't have to be just a flat wall. You can give it texture. You can give it things that stick out. You can envision you know, large flower pots attached on the outside of the seawall. So now it will gather some sediments. You'll get a whole bunch of other animals being able to live on it. So providing texture and a three-dimensional aspect to that flat wall can be really helpful. And there's an article about the Seattle seawall. If you just Google Seattle seawall, you can learn a lot about it and see pictures of what they did. And that was done I'd say, I don't know, five, five to ten years ago, less than ten years ago. So um, th that was what I wanted to talk about. I would just like to make one comment in reference to uh, a remark that was made earlier about the, um, 
what was it called? The, the, the barrier, the storm surge barrier. Um, pictures I've seen of, of that plan includes at the New Jersey end and the, if it's Rockaway or Coney Island end, permanent things that are projecting into the New York Harbor. So it's not that the stuff sits on land and then when the storm is coming, it closes up. They're sitting permanently there, narrowing the channel for the water to go in and out. And then when the storm is coming, then the whole thing closes. But it's permanently obstructing the normal flow of the water. And if you picture water that's going pretty fast and now you reduce where it's got to go through, it's going to go through like Dickens, right? It's going to go through a lot faster because you've taken away a lot of the room for it to be in. And under those circumstances, the scouring and destruction of the shoreline and the bottom by this water that's going full force into and out of the harbor can be really destructive. And I don't think the people who are planning that thing have thought thought right. about that right. part. Thank you. And that's thank you. Next. Hi, uh, Buck Moorhead. I'm a board member with New York Passive House. Thank you, uh, Chairman Costantinides, for having this hearing and your patience in listening to all of us speak here. We mm -hmm. appreciate it. Uh, uh, New York Passive House fully supports uh, the goals of, of uh, the 80 by 50 plan. Uh, we recognize, as, as most people do, that 75% of, of the city's energy use is in building energy. Mm -hmm. And about half of that energy is actually in heating and cooling loads. So uh, uh, focus on measures that address the building's envelope and reduction of those required heating and cooling loads will uh, effectively reduce the overall required uh, energy use. We appreciate the efforts that the city council has made uh, very aggressively and specifically your committee to propose legislation that's directed at uh, energy conservation and also alternative energy uh, measures uh, that you've done. Uh, I mean, there were six or seven bills in June, I think, or some. If I'm, I may be miscounting, but uh, we so we you passed 16 bills last year out of the committees. We were busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just missing a digit there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so uh, uh, we appreciate the efforts of the city council. We also appreciate the, the efforts of uh, the mayor's office. Uh, for long-term planning and sustainability, which has been working. You know, we, we find when New York Passive House assists with these measures that we're, we're talking with city council and we're also talking to the mayor's office about ways to find the best ways to, to draft that legislation so that it's, it's uh, readily understood and that it's implementable and that you can measure and verify outcomes at the end because we want it all to work. Right. Uh, energy conservation, is, is really the, the, the least sexy of these alternative, it's not an alternative energy, it's simply reducing the amount of energy you require. We'll always want solar and wind and alternative energy, <coughs> but it will be, uh, you'll just need less solar if, if one takes care of the envelope properly. So uh, we will continue, uh, New York Passive House is a collaborative organization. We wanna work with city council, with the mayor's office as we can with other of our colleagues, uh, environmental organizations, to tr try to help form the best way forward. Uh, so uh, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Diana Sweetai. I'm Director of Planning and Land Use at Manhattan Community Board One, whose district includes most of Manhattan below Canal Street, south of the Brooklyn Bridge, as well as Ellis, Governors, and Liberty Islands. Thank you for holding this important hearing today and inviting testimony on sustainability and resiliency. CB1 commends the many years of leadership from the city council in tackling greenhouse gas emissions from our buildings, the largest source of the city's carbon emissions. Intro 1745 of 2017 is a bold and innovative step towards cutting carbon emissions and reaffirm New York City's leadership in tackling climate change. We look forward to the council reintroducing and passing this bill a critical step in the holistic approach to addressing sustainability and resiliency. 
Lower Manhattan continues to be one of America's largest business districts and our residential population is one of the fastest growing in the whole city. Our district is only 1.5 square miles, but it has a huge impact on the city and regional economies. In 2013, Lower Manhattan had a gross economic output of over $62 billion and generated an estimated $2.4 billion in city tax revenues. Our district remains a resilient place that more and more people want to live, work, and visit. We have a lot of work to do to assure that these powerful growth trends result in a district that is protected and livable for all. At a height of seven feet, Community District 1 experienced one of the highest inundation levels in Manhattan during Superstorm Sandy. Two people in our district drowned, and the storm resulted in billions of dollars of damage to infrastructure, housing, and commercial property and utilities. As we approach the sixth anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, the board is concerned both the short-term and long-term timeframes as Lower Manhattan remains largely unprotected. We face an increasing potential for suffering extreme weather events and subsequent damage to Lower Manhattan and low-lying areas across the city. CB1 has worked collaboratively with city, state, and federal representatives since October 2012 when Sandy devastated our community. We thank the city for the funds it has already contributed towards resiliency in Lower Manhattan. The Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Project, or LMCR, is underway, but there is a substantial funding shortfall. CB1 maintains that it is critical to fully finance the LMCR project and ensure that our district is protected in the future. It is unclear where the required funding will come from, and we urge the city to find ways of securing additional funding resources for the construction of a more resilient Lower Manhattan. As the LMCR project goes through the initial analysis and preliminary design stages, more is uncovered that adds challenge to an already monumental task. Not only is Lower Manhattan surrounded by water on three sides, but all of the edges have been built out on landfill presenting unique vulnerability and challenges. The Office of Recovery and Resiliency team is uncovering more complexity in protecting Lower Manhattan than was ever imagined, and this will lead to greater challenges, cost, and commitment. CB1 also commends the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency on the work they have done thus far to analyze the problem and begin to formulate a plan, both for the long term and more recently for intermediate measures. This is a Herculean task that has never before been attempted. However, every year since Sandy that the city doesn't endure a hurricane feels like a narrow miss and eventually our luck will run out. We must all work together to ensure that creative and effective sustainability and resiliency measures are put in place to protect Lower Manhattan and the entire city now and in perpetuity. Thank you. We look forward to working with you guys and, and exploring this further. So thank you all for your testimony today. So the, 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 uh, the last panel, uh, Lisa, uh, DiCapri, uh, Andreas, Benning, Benzing, sorry, yeah. and either Pete Sikor or Patrick Houston. All right, you want to start there? On the, on the left, here, here. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chairperson uh, Constantinidis, for allowing us to uh, testify today at the public hearing. My name is Andreas Benzing. I'm president of New York Passive House, and I will keep it very short. Mayor de Blasio has called climate change the challenge of our generation, and New York City has responded to this challenge by committing to achieving greenhouse gas reduction of 80% by 2050. Passive house buildings, which achieve substantial energy reductions and resiliency through cost-effective and skillful design and construction are key to achieve these commitments. These buildings use up to 90% less energy for heating and cooling and up to 70% less energy overall. Furthermore, in the event of power outage, they can remain comfortable for long periods, even in extreme weather. With their substantially lower energy requirements, the passive house approach enables the construction of net zero energy buildings that feature low to no resilience on fossil fuel energy. It is exciting to see the application of passive house evolving in New York City. We currently have about 100 building, large buildings as well going up in the city or, or around the city. 
Uh, we applaud the drafting of the stretch code by Nasura, which includes pass for section, at least in the residential code. We hope it survives the bill of writing, and we hope it will be included in the commercial code as well. And we applaud your uh, leadership in pushing uh, energy efficiency for buildings uh, in the city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lisa DiCaprio. I am a professor of social sciences at NYU, where I teach courses on sustainability. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this oversight hearing on recovery and resiliency. In his January 7, 218 New York Times article on the implications and politicization of the new FEMA flood maps for New York City, David Chen notes that New York, with its 520 miles of coastline, quote, has more residents living in high-risk flood zones than any other city in the country, and the pace of development along the water has only increased since Superstorm Sandy. Are the waterfront edge design guidelines adequate, given new scientific studies about the relentless rise of our oceans, which will only accelerate in the future? The Climate Central Surging Seas Risk Zone Map illustrates how New York City will be flooded at different levels of sea level rise. We should be especially alarmed by the current and projected days of sunny day high tide flooding. This phenomenon, as New York Times reporter Justin Gillis explained in his September 3rd, 2016 article, flooding of coast caused by global warming has already begun, is now real and not just a theoretical possibility. Quote, for decades, as the global warming created by human emissions caused land ice to melt, and ocean water to expand, scientists warned that the accelerating rise of the sea would eventually imperil the United States coastline. Now those warnings are no longer theoretical. The inundation of the coast has begun. The sea has crept up to the point that a high tide and a brisk wind are all it takes to send water pouring into streets and homes." End quote. A new National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration report on sunny day high tide flooding is detailed in a March 28, 2018 Washington Post article by Jason Samnow. Federal report, high tide flooding could happen every other day by late this century. By 2050, according to this report's projections, quote, high tide flooding will occur between 50 and 250 days per year along the East Coast, depending on the greenhouse gas emission scenario, end quote. Aldrin Caldas, senior climate scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists, is quoted as saying, quote, just imagine seeing streets and property flooded every other day. That gives a completely new meaning to the term nuisance flooding, or actually, it completely obliterates the concept, as flooding would become much more than a nuisance but a rather serious problem requiring significant resources and innovative policies, end quote. In New York City, sunny day high tide flooding is already affecting several low-lying communities in Queens that surround Jamaica Bay, as described in Nathan Kessinger's October 12, 2017 article, in Queens, chronic flooding and sea level rise go hand in hand. These neighborhoods include Hamilton Beach, Broad Channel, and Howard Beach. What is the status of the current resiliency projects for these communities, which include a new storm surge berm, street raising, and bulkhead projects? According to projections of sea level rise made by the New York City Panel on Climate Change, certain areas of Hamilton Beach and Broad Channel may experience tidal flooding on a daily basis. Are the current resiliency projects adequate given these predictions? or are they simply providing the illusion of protection? Related to this question, is New York City sufficiently prioritizing planning and the allocation of resources for resiliency initiatives or even relocation if necessary for existing communities at risk? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Hey everybody, my name is Patrick 
I am with New York Communities for Change. Patrick Houston, I'm with New York Communities for Change. Uh, thank you for the time to testify. And um, today I'm going to go through the document that uh, was shared with you, but for the sake of staying within the time limit, I'll skip over small sections if you see me briefing through. Mm -hmm. So as you know, inequality and climate change are two of the greatest moral crises of our time. Um, they're deeply intertwined and they're especially an issue here in New York. And so at the city level, New York Communities for Change, um, we're focused on the city's top source of climate pollution and the greatest job creation opportunity outside of direct spending to create jobs, which is to clean up dirty buildings here in the city. So buildings like Trump Towers, like the Kushner Building, um, large buildings like this are only 2% of the city's buildings overall, but they're responsible for almost half of the city's climate pollution. Um, and so New York as a whole currently generates about 50 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, lar and this is the large buildings, large buildings over 25,000 square feet, that's the 2%. They generate about 20 to 25 m uh, million metric tons of CO2 equivalent pollution. So that's more pollution than most countries. So as you know, the administration has done a wonderful analysis of the problem in the one NYC which follows on the plan NYC, um, and the key is to follow through. Um, so you know the council passed the mayor's enacted, um, the council passed and the mayor enacted law committing New York City to at least 80% reductions of climate pollution by 2050, um, and the city has bound itself to act, but the problem is that the mayor's plan for addressing nearly half of the city's climate pollution is hugely insufficient in terms of climate and air pollution reductions. Um, it also doesn't do a good job at addressing uh, good and fair labor standards. And even worse, it will lead to and contribute to the widespread MCI issue um, with the rent hikes and rent regulated housing. Um, already about 2 million New Yorkers depend on um, rent regulated housing. So to be precise, the pollution impact of the mayor's plan for large buildings will cut pollution citywide about 7% by 2030. Um, but those large buildings are nearly, again, 50% of the city's climate, pro um, climate pollution. Uh, the mayor's proposal would lead to large scale energy, would not lead to large scale energy efficiency upgrades. So since it doesn't require large scale upgrades except in um, a limited number of residential buildings, it therefore does not create the economic activity needed, um, nor that economic activity that is potential. Um, so. NYC would not get the jobs that it could employ thousands of people, um, especially people in moderate and low income communities because a lot of these jobs won't require um, a college education um, and other forms of advanced education. And so I'm gonna jump down now. So thank you, council member and chairperson Constantinides um, for the plan that you've been working on. Um, this is the intro 1745. Um, and by our experts' analysis, the, this intro 1745 generates about 13% of climate pollution cuts by 2050. That's much better than the mayor's um, projected 7% by 2050. Um, so we believe that that plan 1745 um, is onto a good start, and our experts say if continued, it can help us achieve 80% reductions by 2050. So it's at the right pace. And so the mayor's plan and and intro 1745, um, both unfortunately would lead to rent hikes in rent regulated housing. And so displacement and homelessness are a crisis that we do not want to contribute to as we address the, the climate issue. Um, I'm gonna jump down. And so it is our hope that any bill that's introduced um, on buildings on this topic fixes the problem of um, and avoids the problem of rent regulated housing and uh, incurring the cost of MCIs from the building retrofits. New York City must also, and then the second key part, um, New York City must also ensure that good labor standards to produce good jobs and high quality work should be part of any final legislation. Um, uh, or, um, excuse me, final legislation or package of legislation and budget items. Uh, this oversight form shines a spotlight on a fundamental failing of the MOS, the lack of even a plan or a proposal, much less finalized law to reach 80 by 50. Um, that's impossible without dealing with large buildings, 
that ought to be at the top priority um, of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability agenda. And last, I'm gonna jump down one more time to the bottom of the third page. Um, so we believe that you know it's time, beyond time, for New York to become the world's leader with providing, um, addressing climate issues and becoming a jobs leader as well by requiring that large buildings slash climate pollution drastically on pace to achieve 80 by 50. And that's gonna require that these mandates go through to 2050 and not stop at 2030. Um, two, that fair um, labor standards are attached to these jobs. And finally, that tenants of affordable housing don't incur the cost of the energy efficiency retrofits in large buildings. So again, thank you for the um, ability to testify and thank you for the work that you've begun um, with addressing dirty buildings in New York City. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. I appreciate your time. Uh, with that, uh, I thank everyone who testified today for your time and your uh, input here today. And we look forward to continuing working with both the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and the Office of Recovery and Resiliency. I want to thank the staff as well um, today, everyone, uh, all of our staff, our legislative attorney, uh, both of them today. <laughs> uh, Nadia Johnson, our policy analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, our financial analyst, and my staff, Nick Wazowski. So with that, I will gavel this uh, meeting of the Environmental Protection Committee closed.